Yeah, hello and welcome to the Chessable Classroom. And I hope you are all here in the classroom itself on Chessable or on YouTube or Twitch where you can also watch the show. Yeah, I'm going to um, introduce myself first. You may not know me. I'm Christoph Zelekin, international master from Germany and one of the first uh, Chessable authors. I started to write courses for Chessable, create courses in 2016 five years ago i think almost exactly five years ago my first course was released and i have released i think eight nine courses that's probably right so you might know me from the platform or from from other shows that i've done for for chessable for chess 24 or others so today i want to show you some interesting moments of the games played today in the chessable masters tournament we had um, yeah, very exciting games and actually far too many to, um, yeah, to check them all out. So I will um, yeah, look at some interesting moments that I remember from the live broadcast that I did earlier. I'd like to start with the first game played in the match between Vladislav Artemyev and Hikaru Nakamura. So let me load that game. And I want to start at the very beginning. I don't want to make, um, yeah, don't want to make an opening overview here um, about it, but I want to show how it happened, how, how the game um, developed in the first couple of moves. So Artemyev played knight f3 and Hikaru, played d5 and e3. This looks um, a little bit surprising, maybe not a very ambitious um, approach at first. It looks like, um, yeah, a little bit passive maybe, but the idea quite often is to, um, yeah, not directly attack, but rather delay the action a little bit into the middle game. And we see that um, White actually got a very exciting position. So let's go ahead a little bit. Knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, normal development so far, b6. Hikaru wants to develop the bishop here to the long diagonal and maybe after a capture, enjoy a good post on b7 for this bishop. White played b3 with essentially the same idea. The white bishop is also nicely placed on b2. So bishop b7, bishop b2, d takes c4. As I said, black wants to get this diagonal open. At least that's one very reasonable option, not the only one. Um, black also can play um, the bishop here, develop it to d6 or to e7. I actually cover this position in one of my chessable courses, the lifetime repertoire 1c4 knight f3, where I present an opening repertoire based on this setup for white. And um, the later positions in the game are very typical for this opening. So d takes c4 and b takes c4, white takes with the pawn and wants to keep control over the d5 square. Before I continue, you always have the opportunity to write here in chat in the Chessable classroom. So if you have a question about um, the position or anything else you want to address, please, you're welcome to write. And um, at a later stage, um, we might even do like a, a question and answer part of the show once I've looked through this game. So d takes, b takes, bishop to e7 to develop, bishop to e2, castles, queen c2, c5. Now, this is a very interesting moment because in this position, the most natural move for white is probably to castle kingside. So if you ask, let's say 10 players in this position, what would you play? Most of them would probably say, yeah, I'm going to get my king into safety, right? A castle to the king side, it's safe there. And then maybe a later d4 plan, let's say a rook here, 
pawn to d4 to play in the center. This would be probably the approach that um, a player, let's say 30, 40 years ago would have chosen, but not today. Nowadays, there is an interesting alternative that people would consider, and that is to use the stable center. Currently, the center is relatively stable. There's nothing happening here. If um, yeah, white doesn't play d4, there is not any action happening in the middle of the board. Black cannot play e5 or start a peace attack. It's fairly quiet in the middle of the board. So white plays rook to g1 which um, yeah, has a very direct and aggressive idea, playing g4 and g5, starting a rush on the king's side. That is very, very aggressive. And it's not just an idea that is related to a, a mating attack. White might um, mate the black king, based on g4, g5, the rook coming and so on. Yeah, But it's also about gaining space. And space is extremely important in chess. If you have more space, you usually have more options. And we will see in this game that this is very, very relevant. It's not just um, yeah, hacking against the king. So rook g1, black played knight to c6. And white, of course, as planned, goes, I know, he doesn't play g4 immediately, sorry. He plays a3 to stop knight b4, right? This is a bit of an annoying move. So a3, knight to d7, and then g4. The idea of knight d7 was to play knight e5 and trade um, one minor piece. Also to get the bishop to f6. The disadvantage of this um, idea is it's pretty slow. And we see that in the game after g4, knight to e5, white captures and plays castling queenside. Of course, after rook g1, yeah, you need to do something with your king. There's no kingside castling anymore. So the white king goes to the queenside. There was a remark in the chat that there is a line in the Philidors where rook g1 and g4 is an option. That's absolutely true. The g4 idea is now commonly seen in many openings and often um, it's mostly about pushing away the knight on f6. And here that has already happened. Yeah, the knight on f6 has voluntarily retreated to d7, then to e5. So it, it had some direct effect. Now, here after castling um, queenside, black played a6, which is probably intending to play b6 to b5, opening up the queenside. Um, there was a question, why not castling long before g4? Um, it's not a bad idea to castle before um, rook g1 and g4, but I think um, both options make, uh, make perfect sense. So it's more of a matter of taste. Important, I think, is to recognize that this idea in itself is valid. Yeah, you can play with this g4 push and queenside castling instead of a more conservative kingside castling. So a6, f4 to attack the knight. And we see that white has gained <clears throat> quite a bit of space already. The f pawn is now also rushing forward. And here, um, yeah, this is the game between Artemyev and Nakamura, the first game of their match today in the chessable masters. Um, Black now has a decision where to put the knight. And in the game, um, Hikaru made, a, for me, a surprising decision. Um, but it, um, it, was not, it was not a bad one. I just um, didn't expect it to happen. So I, I would have expected the knight to go back to c6 and maybe um, yeah, trying to do something on the queen side, look for a counterplay maybe connected to b5, knight a5, things like that. That was um, an option for sure. 
he played knight to g6. And when I saw that uh, played live, I was a little bit in doubt if that's a good idea because white gains um, yeah, even more time by kicking the knight again. So f5. Now it looks like an attack. White is rushing the pawns here up the board. And now um, it's important, first of all, to recognize black should never take on f5. That would be by far too accommodating because then the g file is open for the rook. Now white's rook would be ideally placed and you can easily imagine um, yeah, tactical uh, disasters happening quickly. For example, if the knight goes here, you see that the rook is lined up on g7 and the bishop is lined up on g7. So it's already um, pretty close um, in terms of decisive tactics to happen. Um, knight d5, for example, looks like a very strong option already intending to take on g7. So a black should never open the g-file like that. That is too risky. So he has to move the knight again. And the move knight e5 going into the middle of the board was what um, yeah, we mostly checked during the live coverage as going into the middle of the board is almost always the best idea. Centralization is a very useful concept. However, here after knight e5, white has a strong move, knight to e4 to make a discovered attack against the e5 knight. And this is very annoying. What should black play now? The knight is attacked and you don't really have a great reply to that. You don't want to open the G file again. So E takes F5 like this. It looks very bad. Again, everything is perfectly placed here. Sorry, knight E4, we should put that on the board. Um, I don't really see a great defense here for black. Yeah, if black takes the knight, we capture here and that looks fantastic. So knight e5 is also not looking um, great, which prompted Nakamura to go to h4. Yeah, we, we all know the knight on the rim is dim, is a famous, famous uh, saying. And the knight on h4 is not brilliant, but it is at least somewhat helping in defending. Yeah, now what did um, Artemyev play here? He went knight e4 and opened up this diagonal. So here um, Nakamura decided to take the knight on e4. Um, this is probably a necessary move. It's very difficult to to do uh, something else because white already has very strong threats. It's um, difficult to suggest an alternative. So the bishop has taken on e4. Oops, I'm sorry. Knight e4, bishop takes e4, and queen takes e4. Yeah, now um, white has gained the pair of bishops. That is nice. This one is already pretty strong and the bishop on e2 currently doesn't look that fantastic, but we'll see how the game develops. Two bishops are nice to have. Now, um, white is currently threatening to take on e6, simply grab that pawn. But Hikaru found a nice reply, played bishop f6 and tries to trade away the bishops here. White um, has the two bishops and if you can trade one of them, that's usually an accomplishment. Yeah, here white has um, yeah more than one interesting option, but Artemyev took on e6. 
that pawn is hanging. So he decided to, to grab it. And now Nakamura took on b2 with a check and checked again here with the queen on f6. This way he's able to capture this pawn with the queen. Artemiev played king c2 and Nakamura took the pawn on e6 here with the queen. Yeah, and this is a position where white has more than one interesting option. And I'd like to um, make this a quiz position. You should try to find white's best move in this position. So I'm going to activate a quiz now. And it's about a t-shirt, chessable shirt that you can win. I'm not sure, is it a t-shirt or is it a sweatshirt? But, but they are nice, I have one. So all the best of luck to you finding the best move. I'm going to activate the quiz in a moment. So quiz. And I'll give you, um, it's not so easy. It's not, it's not a tactic. I mean, I don't look for like mates or something. You have to find um, a good move. I'm, I'm giving you like, um, like 90 seconds. Yeah, that's, that seems good. And I'm going to start the quiz in a second, start quiz. So what move would you play for, for white here? You got 90 seconds to find a good one. Again, it's not a tactic. Yeah, I'm thinking about if I want to give you any hints, but I don't think this is fair because we already have some sub, um, yeah, some moves that have been submitted and I don't want to be unfair there. So I let all the time pass here. The whole 90 seconds. Now we got many correct solutions. And it's five seconds. Uh, make sure to submit. All right. So I'm not sure you don't see it right away, but I can give you the solution here. Um, the best move, I think, and the move played in the game is the move bishop to d3. That is nice because the bishop is covering the queen. The queen was attacked on e4. And at the same time, we threaten a checkmate on h7. And that makes this move very attractive as black does not really have a great alternative to taking on e4 when the white bishop will be excellently placed. And we have a winner of the shirt, and it's me. I have submitted the move um, the quickest. I'm sorry. But actually, we have some other people who were pretty quick. And the one who's really getting the shirt is Hawkeye373, if I'm not mistaken. So congrats to Hawkeye very quickly um, with, the, with the correct move, bishop to d3. We've had some other suggestions. And um, I have to say that um, taking on e6, just going back here for a second, um, taking on e6 also looks quite reasonable. Yeah, making um, or trans, um, transforming um, the position to this. However, there is, there will be more quizzes. Yeah, yeah. we will have another shirt um, quiz a little bit later. So here, um, the difference is to the game when we had bishop d3 and now black um, black was, let me 
to get to the moves. When black was taking here and the bishop recaptured, the, the key difference is that here, black does not have an, a fully open file. If you just look at all the files on the board and look at the black rooks, and here, black rooks, this is currently attacked, and this is still on f8, black cannot um, enter with any of, of their rooks. There is no entry point anywhere. And if white, instead of bishop d3, would have captured on e6, then you might say, okay, this pawn looks a little bit uh, weak, it's isolated, but the big difference is black can jump into f2 here with his rook and get active. Of course, white can prevent it with rook f1, but that would probably lead to further trades and that is not really what white is after here. So this would probably um, be quite helpful for black. It seems better to play this move bishop d3, which is also why I made it a quiz move. It's here more or less forced for black to take. There is this threat on h7. So the queen has taken, the bishop takes, and now we can still, we can put the rook move on the board, rook a to d8. Now, <clears throat> why is white better in this position? You have to compare the two pieces, the knight on h4 and the bishop on e4. The bishop on e4 is placed right in the middle of the board and controls many squares. Yeah, we have the whole long diagonal, but also it has some scope in this direction. When the knight is currently on h4 and does basically nothing. Black has to lose some time to get this yeah, back, um, yeah, back into the game, maybe via g6 or e7. But that takes time. And white, in the meantime, has some more active ideas. If you look at this position, it's important to check what are possible weaknesses that I can attack. What kind of plan can I devise here for white? And looking at pawns, it is very relevant in this position that um, many moves ago, actually, when that was not really obvious, Black played a6, and this is very important here, as b6 is now a weak pawn. This position wouldn't be um, as much advantageous as it is if the pawn would be back on a7. If you imagine the pawn on a7, white wouldn't have a clear target that he can simply attack. This is what happens in the game. White plays rook to b1 and puts pressure on this weakness. This is a very simple way um, to find a plan. Try to spot a weakness in the opponent's camp, like a weak pawn or weak square, and try to position your pieces in a way that they connect to those weaknesses. And here, rook b1 is such a move. White gets some pressure against the pawn. This is not the only advantage that white has here. An additional point that is relevant is the kings. If you look at, um, I didn't want to do that. Um, if you look at the kings here in this position, white's king on c2 is um, taking part in active operations. The king can go to c3, for example, support a d4 push. This is really an active piece and not a target. Black doesn't have any attack against our king. In fact, white is using the king as an active piece that can even attack in some cases. Compare that with the king on g8. All those things add up and gives white, uh, or give white a quite significant advantage. Not something that is um, like a forced win or anything like that, but it's very comfortable and you can nicely press forward. So rook b1 was answered with rook to d6 covering the pawn. And now rook to b3, again, looking at this weakness and trying to use this rook as well. So 
oh, I'm sorry, that was the wrong button. So rook b3, knight to g6. The knight should help in the defense. Rook b1, rook to b8. Yeah, and here an interesting decision that uh, was not completely obvious to me during the game, but it turned out to be a good one. Um, White now played the move rook to d3, trying to trade one pair of rooks. And the idea is that with one rook traded, it is much easier to use this king. If you imagine in this position with both rooks, White would try to play, let's say, king c3 and d4. That looks like black might have some counterplay with two rooks, yeah? And with just one, it will be much less. This is actually something that happens quite often. If you have a strategic advantage, it's sometimes useful to trade just one rook, not both rooks, but one rook. You often want a rook and a minor piece to work together and attack weaknesses, but trading one rook is often useful to get um, yeah, the opponent's counterplay a little bit down. So rook d3, black traded, bishop takes. Ah, I keep hitting the wrong button on my keyboard. That's not good. Knight e5, bishop e2. King f8, the black king is approaching the, the action, wants to help in the defense. Yeah, and now white played the move d4 finally. And certainly um, a good moment to do that, attacking the knight. In many games, the move d4 is played on the very first move. And here we have an uncommon situation. Yeah? d4 is played on move 30, deep in the end game. So the knight is attacked and now retreated to d7. It's probably not great to take on d4 here. Um, Hikaru does that a little bit later on the next move. But yeah, there's a question. Let me see. Instead of rook b8, could black have tried rook d8 with the idea to um, look at the d pawn? Yeah, let, let's have a look there. Um, there were a couple of rook b8s actually like you mean here? Probably here, right? The move rook to d8. That's an interesting option. But probably you can play d3 here. Yeah, the bishop here does a nice job covering this. And then b6 is hanging again. I don't think you can avoid rook b8 altogether. It looks to me. Ah, okay. So you want to do this and then claim, yeah, you cannot cannot exchange with rook d3. That's certainly true. Um, one idea that I would suggest then would be a4 in this position, threatening a5. And after black plays a5, there is this annoying move rook b5, which attacks both pawns due to this pressure on the B file. But you're right, um, what a Kromnik student uh, wrote in the chat, that was definitely an idea that Black could have, could have tried. Jumping to the position that we had after D4, Nakamura went to D7 with the knight. And now the bishop was coming to F3 here on the long diagonal. We see how much better the bishop is compared to the knight. The knight is currently on d7 and does not have anything to attack. There is no target for this piece. A knight ideally wants to be placed on a square where it attacks a pawn or goes to a square where it cannot be yeah, driven away, where it is safe, where it is stable. And the knight on d7 has nothing to attack. That is a a key problem here for black. If black would have a lot of time, then maybe he could organize this. Let's say, yeah, run the king to c7 and then 
move the knight around. Currently, he cannot even move the knight. If you would move it, let's say to f6, I mean, he's coming from that square, so that doesn't make much sense anyway, but you would simply blunder the pawn due to the b file pressure. And that means black currently cannot really move this piece. And therefore, Hikaru decided to take on d4 so that the pawn on c5 is not always under attack. Now, rook c8 played, attacking this pawn with a check and covered here with king d3 by Artemiak. So white has this much more active king. And if you look at the pawns, already a pass pawn. The d pawn is not really so dangerous at the moment as the black king is so close. Yeah, the king is always close here to stopping the pawn. It would be a pretty big mistake, for example, to advance the pawn quickly. Yeah, black now played the move h6. And for example, now e5, d5 would be a pretty huge mistake. That's a wrong, wrongly timed move. Not just for, I mean, here we even have tactical problems as there's a check here and a check here, but it would also uh, not really be a dangerous pawn as black can always stop it with the king coming towards the pawn. So that is not um, really White's idea. He played the move a4 first, a5. Black is concerned that White is pushing the a pawn forward, so a5 by Black. And now a nice move by White, he played the move h4. And the idea of it is to play g5 next, taking away yet another square from this knight that it can even, that it cannot even come back. So here um, Hikaru took quite a bit of time to make a, yeah, make a decision. And I think it was here that he realized he's not just a little bit under pressure or yeah or it's he realized it's getting serious now because if you imagine white coming to g5 with the pawn i can unpaint a little bit to g5 then bishop g4 will put more pressure on black even there is a suggestion if bishop b7 um was an idea. Let me check. Um, so are we talking about this one? Here, bishop to b7. Okay, let me check. That is certainly um, something that you want to have a look at. Um, I think the issue is that after bishop b7, it's not passive really, but rook d8 is probably coming. When you cannot take it, due to this trick here. Oops, sorry. Check and the bishop. So white cannot take it. And as this is a threat anyway now, you have to probably retreat the piece or move the king again. But that's an important tactic, right? So that's something that you have to check. Another thing is that if you play rook b8, and white takes that after rook a8, this is hanging with a check also. And you don't really want to trade here. White doesn't want to trade more pawns. So in the game, we were here when Nakamura started to think. And this idea g5 is extremely annoying. He played g5 himself. Black played his own G pawn to stop white from advancing. We should have a brief look at the position that would happen if black plays king to e7, like a yeah, less committal move. Then g5 and checking this position, you see that the threat bishop g4 and taking on d7 would win the B pawn. So 
white would remove a crucial defender of the b-pawn. That is also extremely problematic for black and probably um, tough to hold. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so after h4, there was g5 played by Nakamura, stopping the white pawn from coming forward and um, yeah, requiring white to find a different idea. Now, white took on g5 and the um, pawn took on, yeah, re recaptured on g5. Now, um, here white has more than one good idea and one very strong move played in the game was rook b5 now attacking the second weakness by advancing the pawns on the king side like with, with h4 and provoking black's g5 white has created now a second weakness g5 is a weak pawn and b6 is a weak pawn already for a long time a very nice move difficult now for black to defend this. If you play f6, like just mechanically, let's say covering this, then white's idea is bishop e4 to f5. Very annoying. The black knight is completely boxed in and passive. Would be very, very difficult for black. So, Nakamura now tried to defend differently and he played rook to, to d8. Now, um, I have a question and it's a quiz question that is more than one move. So what would happen if white takes on g5? I'm going to start the quiz in a second. He didn't do that, but we want to figure this out. So let me see, I'm giving you 90 seconds again, but before I start, I have to enter the right sequence first. So give me a moment. And start quiz. So what should black do? It's more than one move. It's more than one move. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see if someone has the whole sequence that I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, it's about time, right? If you want the the shirt, it's uh, it's another shirt one. <laughs> so <laughs> it's thirty seconds. Uh, we we already have some good solutions. It's twenty seconds. You should you sh you can still try to get it right. Yeah, I know that the the shirt is already uh, <laughs> already given away basically, but uh, someone was pretty fast. So five, four, three, two, one, and that's it. Okay, so thanks for taking part um, in the quiz. You, almost all of you had the, the first move right, because it looks like with the rook and the king here, being um, yeah lined up, that there is some kind of tactic, right? And the sequence that I was thinking of is to check on c5, check the king. The king moves away, of course. And my idea was that after the king moves to e3 or to c3, that you can actually capture on d4, which is a fun move to play as after king takes knight e6, you have this 
fork. It's a nice little tactic that helps black here. And we have a, a winner of the shirt, and that is Annika. If I pronounce that correctly, congrats. <laughs> yeah. So a nice little fork tactic. You don't want to miss those. Okay, so let's go back to the game. We still have some ground to cover. It's, uh, it's a long game, but it's strategically very interesting. So after rook d8, white um, was playing according to um, a very important end game rule. Don't hurry, don't rush, don't be in some kind of panic. If you have full control, you can take your time and be patient. So Artemiev played king to c3, avoiding all tactics and renewing the threat to take here. So king e7 now played. Hikaru is not playing f6. If f6 would be played, then bishop e4 to f5 is a nice way to continue. We can look at this a little bit more. Let's say bishop e4, king e7, and bishop to f5. And in this moment, bishop d7 is the threat to win the pawn. And what is black supposed to do now? They can play rook b8 to cover this. So now I cannot win a pawn directly, but white has multiple ways to improve his situation. The best move is probably c5, which now asks black for a reply. And that's very difficult as taking here would blunder a piece. Yeah, very nice little idea. So black's defenses here would be terribly overstretched. And this is just far too passive. Bishop c6 was a suggestion here instead of bishop e4. Let me check this. Um, sorry, that was f6. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're right. I was always during this game thinking about this idea, but now here, this is even stronger. Possible because the rook is not on c8 anymore. So here, simply oops simply taking and then taking on b6 is more or less unstoppable yeah you're right rafael in the chat here absolutely so in the game nakamura did not go for that he played king e7 and simply let the g5 pawn go this is the idea go for active counterplay and this is a, an advice that I really um, am very um, passionate about. If possible, try to defend actively in end games. Uh, don't try to defend passively. That is very rarely the right way to play. If you have an active idea, go for that. And this is um, here by far the best defense. And we will see that it was very close to being successful. Rook h8. rook h5, yeah, not allowing the rook to enter. Black went back to c8, rook h6, rook g8. I'm not going through every single move here. I want to, there, there's more to cover a little bit later. Knight f6, rook to b5, switching the rook over to attack this weakness. And now, rook h8. In this particular moment, there is no rook h5 anymore as the knight is on that square. So this is now, um, yeah, more or less unstoppable. Um, there was a question, what about rook e5 instead of rook b5? Yeah, this move is actually the next one that is played. So we played the check and then went for this, if that was your idea. Um, it's, it's quite similar, I think. So rook f5, king e7, g5, attacking the knight. And 
it's again a problem of an unfortunate piece that has no good square to go to. Nakamura went to e8 here. Yeah, 97, it has been there before and it's still totally dominated. All those squares, c5, e5, f6, they're all covered. And white has more than one good way to play from here. You can again think of bishop g4, for example, or even bishop d5 could be an option. If you look at this, putting pressure on f7, it's also pretty annoying. So knight e8 was played in the game. I think Icaro was sick of dropping the knight back and forth from f6 to d7 and wants to go to d6 here to attack the rook and maybe put some pressure on the c-pawn. So after knight e8, white checked on e5, king back to d8, bishop g4, knight to d6. Okay, after knight to d6, now white has a decision to, to make. Do you want to continue to improve the position, try to yeah, do little things or go for something decisive, go for some decisive action. So what um, Vladislav Artemyev did is to yeah, basically pull the trigger here, do something concrete. And he played the move c5, pushing this pawn forward. After the capture, b takes, d takes, we come to another quiz position where it's about uh, what is the price. It's, it's a mark that you can win. And I mean, while I already mentioned, there is a chessable shirt that I actually do have. I don't have a mug, so I have to talk with all the chessable people there. They should send me mugs. I want a chessable mug as well. You can, you can win one now by finding the best defense for black. It's not a move that would save black for sure, but giving black the best fighting chance. I'm going to start the quiz in a moment. and start the quiz now. You, you have 90 seconds again. So what is the best possible defense for black? Oh, many correct and quick answers. Yeah, still one minute to go. And uh, we don't, I, I didn't uh, say that before. I think we don't want to have multiple, multiple winners. So uh, one, one guy winning three prizes um, is probably not, not on. And we don't have that. We have three different winners, which is good. If you win all the prizes, yeah, you probably get banned from those competitions. Uh, that happened to me years ago when, when there were movie quizzes um, in the cinema next next to me, and at some point they banned me from from um, taking part after I won uh, every single prize in one session. And you don't want to overdo it. All right, so 15 seconds left. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have to make them on the board, the moves, right? I'm sorry if that wasn't too clear. So congrats for, or congrats for winning the mug. The chessable mug can be used with tasty coffee, tea, whatever you want. Won by Red Lucy. Congrats, very quick, um, yeah, with entering the correct solution. And I already, in a way, um, had spoiled it, as I said, you want to defend actively in an end game. So if we check the solution here, the right move is the move, I have to find it in that long list of moves, is rook h4. So a counter attack. Black is not interested in moving that bloody knight again. Now you don't have a great square. You have those 
backward moves, which will not help you in any way. Instead, rook h4 is a good way to play attacking this bishop and also activating the rook here on the fourth rank. White now, after rook h4, has the opportunity to take on d6 and go into a rook ending. I want to address this. Um, there was a suggestion to play rook e8. Um, the move rook e8, I think, has one drawback. <clears throat> I'm sorry. White can, can take it. And you have to take with the knight. Ah, rook d5. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah it's been a long day. What I wanted to say is that this is probably a winning ending, but you can of course play this one. I'm sorry, very good in the chat here, suggested by, um, it's very small there on my screen, I, Ivind, thank you. Rook d5, um, we win the knight, very clean win. Yes, much better than my ending, yeah? Rook takes e8. So um, in the I'm sorry in the actual game there was rook h4 and now white could take on d6 for a rook ending but here black has very reasonable chances to save the rook here on g4 is very active looking at two pawns and the king is currently stopping the d pawn pretty well. This is probably um, almost nothing for white. In, in practical terms, you can probably not win this position. So he decided to play the bishop to f3 here. When Hikaru Nakamura played rooks, uh, rook takes a4. A really tricky move. As all of a sudden, there is this one going on. We don't know, I, I don't know, or we don't know um, if they have seen all that beforehand, those tactics. Both sides um, were already pretty low on time. Um, but I assume that it was all um, planned beforehand. Now, the critical move here is the one that was played in the game. That was um, sorry, not bishop c6. Uh, okay, bishop c6. I wanted to say um, rook d5, but then this one does work. He played bishop c6 instead. Yeah, exactly. Bishop c6, attacking the rook. Now, Ikaro played this check, rook c4 check. King to d3. And now at first you think, um, well, isn't black in some sort of trouble here? It looks very difficult. The knight is currently attacked and the knight cannot easily move as then the rook is, um, the rook is hanging. So here black has to find a, a good defense um, that was a question. What about rook a3? You mean here? Probably. Yeah, okay, that attacks the king. And the king doesn't have many squares to go to, but probably king to d4 and then going up the board. You cannot go, go back, of course, like here or here. That would run into a fork but you can probably run up the board. Something like this looks pretty, um, pretty difficult because the knight now um, has no good square to go to. So in the game, we had rook c4, king d3, and now black has to um, yeah, find um, a good resource. And um, it seems that here black has a nice tactical solution in this in this position after rook c1 rook d5 here 
um, Hikaru missed a crucial um, detail that would probably have been enough to save the game. Um, it's tricky, it's tricky to find, but maybe we can find it together. I don't have any more giveaways. I think we have the two shirts and the one mug already, already uh, have, a, have a happy new owner. And it's already um, a suggestion here. King C7, yes. That is a really, really strong move. Attacking the bishop. And the key idea is that after pawn takes d6 with the check, king takes d7, that then rook d1 is picking up this rook and wins even. That's really not what white wanted. So probably this one has to be considered, but then rook takes c5 and all of a sudden that looks pretty funky. Attacked and attacked. So king c7 would have been the move here that Nakamura needed to find. However, he didn't manage to do that with the um, little time already already left. Um, there's a question, what about rook d1 instead of rook takes c5? Where is rook takes c5? I'm not sure where rook takes c5 is. King, king here, rook d, ah, here rook d1. Mm. It's not quite enough probably. Ah, okay, I, I see what you're, what you're saying. Okay, so check. And here, um, after a king move, you want to do this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, um, after king c7, white probably has to uh, pull the plug on the game, like something like takes, takes, rook takes, and um, we probably would have a draw in this in this position a little bit later. He didn't play that, however. He played rook d1 check under severe time pressure already. It's a rapid game, of course. And now after the king move, there was no choice. He had to trade rooks. Rook takes, bishop takes. And now it's very unfortunate. The knight is attacked and if it moves, the f7 pawn falls. And of course, the knight um, has no way to, to sacrifice itself. So white was winning this pawn. And we have um, a much um, reduced position now in terms of material, just two pawns left. Often that is not enough to win if you only have those two pawns left. But here the two pawns are pass pawns and they are very far apart, which is a huge advantage for the side with the pawn. Also the C pawn and the G pawn, they both promote on a light square. So they are supported by the bishop very nicely. And it turns out that this end game is completely winning for white. That means, I mean, we can look at the end of the end of this, the technical conversion. King to c7, bishop e8, stopping the black king from advancing to c6. And now the white king is advancing and so does um, or so is the g pawn knight takes c5 g7 and unfortunately even here with equal material white has a completely dominating position now after the nice move bishop b3 looking at this crucial square, black is actually 
in a form of Zugzwang. You cannot move the king. If we go, go through this step by step, the king cannot move. Those squares are covered. And if you move it anywhere, the knight is dropping. So if you move here, the knight is gone. You can also not move the knight as then the pawn is promoting. And if you are very desperate, you can play a4, but white is of course not taking this pawn. So this would be of course a gross mistake, blundering away your crucial g pawn. But white just very calmly played bishop to a2. And here Nakamura resigned as after a3, you just wait for another move. And here, black now has nothing left. They can play a2, bishop takes, and now black has to, yeah, finally resign if they decided to play on now. Again, the king cannot move, the knight cannot move, and the g-pawn will promote. So this game is a story of bishop against knight. The bishop was much stronger as we have seen throughout basically yeah? from the key position here when after bishop d3 one of the quiz moves the bishop was coming here was fantastically placed here in the middle of the board dominating the knight and even later the bishop played a crucial role coming to squares like when we go uh, go a little bit later. Yeah, we had this one. And later, with h4, this idea to play g5 and bishop to g4. But if we are completely honest there, there was one moment where Nakamura with king c7 could have drawn the game. So we would like to know maybe what went wrong. And in my mind, um, I think that from a practical perspective, maybe it was a little bit too early for um, Artemiev to play c5, like here. Um, I was not able to do a thorough analysis because I did a live um, coverage of this game. So it's um, mostly what we found out during the live broadcast. So I'm not 100% sure, but I think white should probably not immediately play the move c5, but rather try to strengthen the position still a little bit, which is, which is possible. You can play this um, yeah, in a much slower way. After takes, takes, rook h4, Black already has quite a bit of counterplay, and this is not all that all that easy to handle. As we have seen, um, Artemiev allowed this possible, um, yeah, miracle save in a way with this King C7 move here. King C7 would draw the game, and Rook D1 was losing, which is actually not easy to see. Of course, and Nakamura is very, very strong in those quick time controls. And he probably, when you look at this, he probably had some kind of miscalculation, thinking that he would get one of the pawns without any particular trouble. Funny enough, he got the the C pawn pretty quickly as we, have, as we later saw, but the G pawn was already too strong. So that was a pretty long game up to the end game, but I felt it was quite instructive, showing some key concepts of strategic chess, like attacking two weaknesses and exploiting um, a better minor piece. The bishop was much stronger than the knight, and this was super apparent even at the very end, like here, when we see the bishop is just much better than the knight. So there was a game from today, a really, I think, high quality uh, rapid game. Um, I'm done with the game, but we still have a, a nice um, yeah, group of people here in the chessable classroom. 
Um, I'm happy to take um, questions, like general questions, if you if you have any for some minutes. I don't think we want to stretch it for too long because it's scheduled for one hour. But if you have any questions about whatever, basically, I'm happy to do this for some minutes. So anything you might want to ask me about um, this one or a general chess question. Is there anything you want to maybe ask? ask? Um, oh, there are many. Mm, okay, so my next chessable course. I'm currently um, in the first steps of writing Keep It Simple for Black, which will be a full black repertoire against absolutely everything. Yeah, play against uh, e4, d4, c4, knight f3, the rare ones. So it will be, yeah, uh, if you want like one course to rule them all, yeah, with black, have something good against everything that people may throw at you. And I'm shooting for something that does not have like 3000 variations, but rather something a little bit more compact. Um, a question, I don't think I can tackle them all. Um, will I publish non-opening courses? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think next year there will be at least one non-opening course coming. I guess um, middle game, end game. Um, I have some ideas. Um, it's nothing yet. Um, there's no title or anything like that, but I definitely want to do something in that direction. So, um, uh, a question if there's YouTube, um, if there's a YouTube comeback on my own uh, channel, um, not really scheduled at the moment. Um, there are many exciting projects going on. One of them is the Chessable Classroom, which gives also a lots of interactive possibilities. And um, there are also shows that um, I plan to do on Chess24. So I don't have a concrete idea at the moment uh, to work on my, my um, YouTube channel. Um, there's a question, will it be 1G6 against everything? No, it will not be 1G6. I want to do something um, more classical. So it's um, something, I mean, you make it sound like G6 is not serious. I think 1G6 is, is okay, but it will be something more classical. Yeah, probably maybe something with D4, D5, E4, E5, that's likely, but not 100% sure. Um, a way to um, improve prophylactic thinking. Interesting. Um, I do think um, what was already suggested in the in the course chat here, Kramnik's course, will talk about that, or he will talk about that in his course a bit. I haven't um, looked at the course yet. I didn't have any time, and it's pretty freshly released. Um, prophylaxis is also something that can be um, trained with some books. For example, Dvoretsky um, has written many um, well-known books that feature um, prophylaxis as a key concept. Um, oh, I don't know. A reliable book to teach and improve calculation. I'm really unsure, honestly, because I feel um, improving calculation has got a lot to do with um, repetition, doing it often, and it's a little bit like um, improving your, your stamina. If you do any kind of physical activity, and let's say, um, yeah, let, let's say you play, um, you play football or anything that is involving a ball, the, you can improve, let's say, your handling of the ball, but you also just have to be able to have stamina, run for um, fast for a period of time so that you're not uh, exhausted. And calculation, I think, is, is trained similarly to, to stamina in physical sports. You want to do it over and over again. Look at exercises, uh, do calculation, look at um, candidate moves in position. So 
I'm really not sure that it's much about the right book to choose. I think the main point is to do the exercises at all. Just with physical sports, the main problem is often not um, finding something, but, but actually doing it, yeah. So I think it's not so much about the book, but get the, get the work done. Um, that's a cool, cool question. If there's one thing that I would tell a younger me before coming AM, what would it be before becoming an IM? I don't, I don't know, really. I think um, one idea is somewhat um, undercovered, let's say, or not uh, not covered well, like choosing the the subject that you want to study. I always say, um, if you have um, a subject in chess that you really enjoy looking at, it's not a bad thing to focus on that, because um, if you enjoy doing it, you will for sure have it easier to invest the time. Let's say you totally hate opening study, just an example. When, okay, then don't do it all the time. Yeah, do a little bit of it so that you're not having a huge leak in the opening, but focus then on stuff that you like. Look at end games, look at middle games, look at tactics. As long as you're looking at chess and immerse yourself in the game or with the game, then you will improve. I mean, you can always say, okay, is it the absolute best use of my time? Would it be better to do 20 minutes of this or 10 minutes of that? I mean, this is a little bit too much. Do something that you like to do and invest the time there. That might lead to um, some parts of your game um, being uneven because you focused more on stuff that you enjoy, but at least you get it done. If you always think, oh, I really have to learn, I don't know, yeah, how to play rook and bishop against rook, yeah, a long ending, I don't know. Um, if you don't enjoy that, do something else. I mean, chess is also meant to be enjoyable. And I feel that is sometimes underappreciated. Um, your uh, what is my favorite chessable course aside from my own? Oh, that's difficult. Oh, it's really difficult. Um, I think um, I only only have opening courses currently that I have on Chessable besides my own. And I'm not sure what, what my favorite one is because um, I mostly um, have them for reference work. So let's say um, someone recommends um, a line against one of my repertoires and I would look at um, these courses and check how their recommendation uh, fares against um, the one that I had in earlier courses. So I cannot really uh, say um, what um, my favorite one is. There are many really very good ones. I mean, if you see recently, there were many releases on a very high level. Um, I definitely want to check um, Kromnik's course. I've always been a fan of, of Kromnik's. So um, this is probably something that I will enjoy when I have the time to, to study it. So I think we are wrapping this up. We're already a little bit above one hour. I hope you guys enjoyed it here in the Chessable classroom, a really nice um, yeah, new feature on the site. I think as I read John Bartholomew is on tomorrow. So that will also be enjoyable. Maybe I have to sneak in there and this way get one of those mugs if I'm fast enough. Yeah, we have to solve the exercises, of course. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this game. It was a strategic um, lesson, I think that is, um, yeah, good to have. Thanks a lot. And maybe I'll be joining tomorrow as a, as a student, actually, if I'm quick enough. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.